the word. We're in chapter 10. We'll begin reading here in Daniel chapter 10 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 3 and uh, give you a brief introduction to our chapter and then move into our study. Daniel chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meal, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at any time or at all, at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Okay, so the last three chapters of Daniel, chapters 10, 11, and 12, the last three uh, chapters of Daniel record what are called de detailed prophetic revelation. It all is pertaining to future events. And uh, the fact is that chapter 10 actually serves as an introduction to chapter 11. You'll see that when we enter into chapter 11, how this actually proceeds into chapter 11, verse 1 and was really, in, in a sense, an introduction to the 11th chapter. You see, when you get into chapter 11 and you look at verses 2 through 35, there's prophecy that's spoken of there, and that relates to what would be called during the days of Daniel the immediate future. But from chapter 11, 36 to chapter 12, verse 4, these are events that are in the distant future and actually before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so... When you get to chapter 12, verse 5, to the last verse of the, of the chapter, Daniel will conclude with a final message as well as a revelation. We're going to be seeing that as we go through it. But these last chapters contain prophecies that are related to the nation of Israel, to the people of Israel. And so when you look at verse 1, and it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was, was uh, revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, the message was true, but the appointed time was long. Notice he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. And so we're given a date here for those who take notes. This occurs in 536 B.C., which would be late in the life of Daniel. Daniel, it is estimated at this time, is in his 80s, somewhere around 85 or so, maybe a little bit older than that. So this is occurring late in his life. We know that Daniel had entered into captivity right around 606 B.C. And at this time, he's been in captivity for about 70 years or so. And so this message was revealed. It was revealed to Daniel, and it says whose name was called Belteshazzar. So Daniel receives what is called a prophetic message. He receives what we today refer to as a word from the Lord. So it's a prophetic message because the Lord would communicate to certain individuals those things that he intended to do. They were the prophets. In Amos chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. And so what he's doing is God is revealing to his servant, Daniel, who is a prophet, what he is about to do. Now, the message is relating to future events, but it's something that is very clear to him. Notice how he says that he actually understands it. This is something he understood. It says he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In other words, he didn't have to have uh, a revelation of some sort or an explanation of some sort given to him by an angel or any other. And so this time he understands the message. He has an understanding of the vision. And notice how he speaks of it. He says the message is true. Well, obviously we would expect it to be true because the message is from the Lord. But he says also that the appointed time was long. Now, when it says here that the, that the uh, appointed time was long, that's interesting in a way because the word long here has, has different connotations and and uh, one of the commentators I use made a, a point uh, that I want to make to you as it relates to it. Because he says the appointed time was long. The word long has more than one meaning. Obviously, the word long, and you see this, could 
could be speaking of a long period of time, but also the word long in the way that it's presented in the original language speaks of a strenuous time that involves great suffering. And so it's not just a period of time that's being spoken of here in terms of the revelation, but it pertains to something that is long in time, but also has a lot of pain. It has a lot of, of uh, difficulty, and that's what's going to be taking place. And so this is a message that's true. It's from the Lord. It's going to be a long period of time that is strenuous. It's going to be a long period of time that is filled with conflict for the nation of Israel. And so he understands this. He understands the message. He has understanding of the vision. So verse 2, here's his response. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no, no meat or wine came into my, my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And so after receiving this message, his reaction is mourning, fasting, and praying. The contents of the revelation great, caused great concern for him. So he goes into an attitude of prayer, and he mourns, he fasts, he prays. In other words, he's sad, and he's greatly troubled. He's greatly troubled at what he's having revealed to him. And by the way, the way he responds to troubling news or something that caused pain, if you, if you want to, to consider this for a moment with me, that's the proper response of someone who is sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the working of God. When there's something that, that they become aware of that causes concern, the best thing you can do is to actually pray fast, perhaps, and even have a time of grief as you bring your, your heart and pour it out before the Lord. In the book of Philippians, in the New Testament, Paul said something in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, that I think applies to this. He, he said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Cast your cares on him, Peter said, because he cares for you. Jesus said, your heavenly father knows those things you have need of before you even ask. And I think that I've had people say something similar to this in the past where they say, well, you know, when there's nothing else to do, you should pray. No, it's not the last thing you do, guys. It's the first thing. It's the first thing you do. When you hear troubling news, the first thing you do is take it to the Lord. When it, when it impacts you, when it concerns you, and it causes you to mourn, it grieves you, and there's something that you come into contact with or hear about that you get concerned about, the first thing you do is you take it to the Lord in prayer. Why? Because he cares for you. Because he can do abundantly above all you can ask or think. Because there's nothing too hard for the Lord. And you need to, as a believer, you need to, you need to live in that awareness. Because I, I'm telling you, there have been many, many times that I've had needless concerns and needless worries when I should have just cast my care on him in the first place. Instead of carrying this burden on my own shoulders for so long, I've learned over time to, to be quick to release it, to be quick to hand it to him. And that's what happened here. He began to mourn. He began to fast, began to pray. His heart is troubled at what he has heard. And notice what he says. He says in verse 3, he says, I ate no pleasant food. No meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself. He abstained from his normal diet. He followed what would be called simply a plain diet. He had no delicacies, no special foods. And, and he says in verse 3, till, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So he didn't anoint himself at all during this time of prayer and fasting. When I was reading this today and it says he didn't anoint himself, I said, he must have stunk after three weeks. I mean, that's kind of a practical thing. And so, you know, because, uh, because Americans are, we're so used to the idea of cleanliness and, and bathing. Not every American, I've been around a few who have, haven't come to that awareness. But yeah, somebody once said, you, you know what your nationality is whenever you get into an elevator. And it's true. 
you can go to other countries, and some places they just don't bathe. This is a fact. I wonder how many of you know what I mean. It may, some of you, perhaps, who've never really traveled, you may think, that's a mean thing to say. No, it's a true thing to say. It's a true thing to say. It, it's always interesting. I mean, I was in Germany when I was 25 years old, and I used to wear tank tops because when you're 25, you can. Um, <laughs> And I was standing holding on to um, a strap on a subway, and this East German woman was next to me. And I looked at her, and she had a hairier armpit than I did. And I thought, <laughs> I put my hands in my pockets. <laughs> that's really embarrassed. And that's exactly what Daniel wants you to know. But um, <laughs> when we speak of anointing, in this context, anointing is something that you do when you're joyful. It's a picture of joy is what it is. When you anointed yourself, it was a sign of joy. It revealed a joyful attitude, and that's why he said, I didn't anoint myself. What he's saying is because of the fasting, because of the mourning, because of the sorrow and grief of my heart, instead of doing what I would normally do, eating uh, better foods and all, I stopped eating those things. I ate plain foods, and I stopped anointing myself, which is another way of saying that I, I wasn't in a state of joy. And so that's how he's responding. And he did that for three whole weeks. He said in verse 3, I didn't anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So that gives you the timeline. These are actually three seven-day weeks. So verse 4, now... On the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, and so he gives us the date. This is April. The 24th day of the first month, the first month, this would be April. And he says, I'm by the Tigris River. Uh, it is also referred to as the Hidekel. And if you have that in your Bible, it's the Tigris. It's just north of the city of Babylon. So he says, I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, verse 5. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. I lifted up my eyes and behold. In this description, and I'm going to give you a little bit of information here. In this description, what we have is called, there's two words that are usually associated with this. One is theophany. How many of you ever heard that word? Just so I know. Theophany. The word theophany is a, it's a, it's an appearance of, of God. A theophany. It's also called a Christophany. A Christophany is a pre-incarnate um, uh, visitation of Jesus himself. It's called a Christophany, Christophany or a Theophany. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the Lord is who he's describing. And so what we have here is an appearance of Jesus just prior or, or prior to his incarnation. Now, many times in the Old Testament when you have a Christophany, a Theophany, it is very often referred to as, the, 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 the figure is referred to as the angel of the Lord. You probably have heard that or read that in your readings of the scriptures. I'll give you examples. For example, Judges chapter 2, verse 1. The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. No angel ever made a covenant with, with Israel. This is obviously the Lord who is speaking, but he's referred to as the angel of the Lord. In Judges chapter 6, verse 22, now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And so again, this is a Christophany. This is an appearance of, of Jesus Christ prior to his physical incarnation in birth through Mary. In Judges 13, verses 21 and 22, when the angel of the Lord appeared uh, no more to Manoah and his wife, 
Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. And so what we have here, as we're looking at it here in this description and all, this man clothed in linen, etc., is actually a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And he begins to describe him here in verses 5 and 6. He says his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning. And so it, it refers to um, the fact that his waist was girded. It's girded with gold. So this, 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 this belt that he has, his waist is girded. It would be linen. It was like the fine white linen that was worn by priests. You see that in Exodus 29. He speaks of the belt, and the belt is also referred to as a girdle, and it's embroidered with perfect gold. His body, verse 6, is like beryl. It, that's actually a, a chrysolite or topaz, which is a, a gold mixed with green. His face is like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like torches of fire. His voice is like a multitude. It's loud. It's mighty. And what we have is a description that is very similar to one that we saw in the book of Revelation when we went through Revelation recently. And this is a picture of, of majesty and a picture of, of dignity. When you look in Revelation, in chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, uh, John said it like this. He said, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. His voice is the sound of many waters. And so what Daniel has is a Christophany. He, has a, a, he sees the Lord in a pre-incarnate appearance. And as he sees this, it's an, it, you'll see a moment, his response. Now notice how it says in verse 7, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. This reminds me of Saul in the New Testament who would later become Paul and his road to Damascus experience. We see that experience in, in the book of Acts in chapter 9 when, when Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, speaks to us concerning how that Saul was breathing out threatenings against the followers of Jesus Christ and that he had obtained letters giving him permission to arrest any who were following Christ because they considered it, uh, he considered uh, Christianity a heretical sect, uh, false faith, and then he would take them in chains and bring them back and try them as heretics. And we know the story of his conversion, how that while he was on his way to Damascus, having obtained letters giving him permission to arrest people, how that he himself was arrested, how that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And you remember the story, how that he responds and he says, uh, who am I? Who are you? Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. And, and when you persecute one of these who believe in me, he said, you're persecuting me. And so we know that famous story of his conversion, the most famous conversion in history. And later on, he was speaking, and he was sharing some tidbits of that particular testimony. And, and uh, there were these uh, Jewish people who were opposing him at that time. They had thought that he had, had brought a, a non-Jew, a Gentile, into, into the temple area, which, which was forbidden, where they had said that they had I believe he had brought this uh, non-Jew who actually wasn't uh, brought into there, into that area. But he began to defend himself to those who were accusing him. And, and so in Acts 22, let me read this to you, found in verses 6 through 11. He was giving his testimony and he said, About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground, heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth. Whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said. Go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. 
My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Well, this is something very similar here because it says in verse 7, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men who were with me did not see the vision. A great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. The men with Daniel didn't see the vision, but Daniel did, which reminds us that the Lord reveals himself to whomever he wills. Well, in verse 8, therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision and no strength remained in me for my vigor was turned to frailty in me. I, I retained no strength. The immediate effect was that he became weak. He lost all of his strength. And, and he even, appear, is even changed in his appearance. He was completely drained of strength, and he fell to his face. Now, why would he do that? Because in seeing the Lord, Daniel saw himself. You know, the origin of true humility is simply having an opportunity more clearly see who he is because when you see God for who he is you will see yourself for who you are there is no room for boasting in your life when you actually have a close walk with God as a matter of fact rather than becoming a self-righteous person you become what the world refers to as a humble person because the origin of true humility is coming into contact with the Lord a great preacher of another day by the name of Charles Spurgeon said it like this. He said, it is not humility to underrate yourself. Humility is to think of yourself as God thinks of you. It is to feel that if we have talents, God has given them to us. And let it be seen that like freight in a vessel, they tend to sink us low. The more we have, the lower we ought to lie. And so if you want to have humility, it comes to spending time in the word of the Lord and in, in prayerful presence of God. And, and when he had this experience, he said, I had no strength. My strength diminished. My vigor was turned to frailty. I retained no strength. And so he became weak in his presence, becoming aware of his own frailty. Yet, verse 9, I heard the sound of his words and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my, with my face to the ground, completely drained. In complete weakness and humility, he fell before the Lord and he's lying face down. And it was in this complete weakness that Daniel was to be strengthened for revelation. One of the, uh, one of the scriptures all of us in this room are familiar with uh, it is found in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. When the Apostle Paul had been speaking concerning the multitude of revelations and extraordinary experiences that he had with the Lord. But to keep him humble, he said, the Lord provided something for him that he didn't want. He gave him a thorn in the flesh. When you read uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and he speaks of the thorn in the flesh, when you think of thorn, we Americans, we think of thorns. We may be thinking of those goat head thorns that you can step on when you're walking, you know, and they're, they're small. No, the thorn, he's, the, the thorn that's being referred to is actually a tent stake. It's not some small thing. It was a huge thing that he was speaking about. He said, a thorn was given to me. Why? Why did this, did you have this? this intense pressure and pain, why did you have this basically thrust upon you? He said, to keep me humble. To keep me humble. He said, so that I wouldn't glory in the multitude of revelations. Because remember, during that day, in, when you read Second Corinthians, you'll see this. He was actually being, um, he, he had opponents who were trying to undermine his ministry. And, 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 and they were saying, they were calling themselves super apostles. Paul refers to them as the eminent apostles, but the word eminent speaks of them being super apostles. And they were actually comparing themselves with him. And they were saying the things that he's done, they've done mightier. 
And he says, listen, there are things that I can speak to you about. I can talk to you about revelations, how that I went into the third heaven and I saw things and I heard things that are not lawful to repeat. I, I could speak concerning those things. But God, because of the multitude of revelations that he gave to me, gave me also a, a tent stake that was in my flesh. He said to keep me humble so I could learn one lesson. And that's in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And that, by the way, is one of those prayers that most of us never ask God to answer. God, would you please give me a stake in my, I want to get married. No, God, would you put a stake in my flesh? God, will you, will you bring humility to me? Do you want it? I think that sometimes sometimes we learn prayers that are appropriate to pray in front of people that we never pray privately. Oh, Lord, humble me, we say in front of crowds or friends. But in private, we don't pray that. Why? Because we know that humility comes at a cost. And if you walk with the Lord for a while, you begin to learn that. Oh, Lord. I'd love you to give me patience. And then you go, well, how do you get patience? You go through trials. You go through pain, right? The only person who sincerely ever prays for patience is a doctor. Everybody else just say, I, wanna, I want patience. And Lord, I want to learn to love. And what does the Lord do? He brings people into your life that are difficult, difficult to love, doesn't he? You, say, you know, I don't want to love that much, Lord, you know. <laughs> and so I've discovered that, have you? I'm sure you have. When you begin to pray, the Lord will answer your prayers, but he very often does it in ways that you didn't expect. Lord, I want patience, and you go through trials. Lord, I, I want to learn to love. You encounter difficult people. Lord, I want to live with hope, and you go through terrible trials. Struggles, pains, and losses. That's how it happens. That's how your faith is refined. And why is that? Well, because God says, my, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And there, therefore, I will glory in my weaknesses because God's strength remains on me. And that's the mature thing to do. Well, in this particular case, we have Daniel going through some very difficult time. And, and there he is on the ground. And, and as this takes place, verse 10, suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. He said to me, oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Well, this other person uh, is, is an angel. This is not Jesus. This is an angel. But notice with me that Daniel was trembling on his knees, but he also was trembling while he stood. And again, that's what happens when God reveals himself to us. In Psalm 96, verse 9, it reads, Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, tremble before him all the earth and now he's going to explain why daniel's answer uh for in his prayer uh had been delayed and this is uh this is really interesting as we look at this in verse 12 he said to me do not fear daniel for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your god your words were here were heard i have come because of your words but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I, I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. And so from the time you determined to understand the message, you're and prayed your, your words were heard. Now, in chapter 9, we saw in verse 20, 21, 
while Daniel was speaking in prayer, we saw how that Gabriel came to bring the answer. And remember, as I said to you last time, as Daniel was praying, the answer was already on the way. God's ears were open to his prayers. This reminds me of 1 Peter 3, 10 through 12, where it says, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Well, God's ears were open to the prayers of Daniel. But in this case, there's a delay. Have you ever wondered why sometimes there seems to be an incredible delay in the answer to any prayers that you pray? There are times that we will sense a delay. Sometimes we may pray and we wonder why our prayers seem to go unanswered. And, and there, are, there are biblical reasons for this. For example, sometimes we're simply in sin. You know, we're living in sin, and here we are praying. And the Bible tells us in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But here we are in sin, just living and practicing in sin. And we wonder, how come heaven seems to be, you know, close to me? Why are, why are the heavens like brass? My words seem to rise only as far as the voice travels, and then they fall to the ground unheard. Well, sometimes uh, it's because I'm living in sin and all, and I have to deal with that. Sometimes we may pray with selfish reasons. We, we, we are asking God for something, not, not, not to bring glory to him or to be a blessing to others, but just because we want it for ourselves. In James 4, verse 3, it says, when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. Sometimes we have unanswered prayer because we're asking for something that's not his will for us. And that, I think, a lot of times people have a difficult time with that one you know no everything god god I, I read this on facebook with the facebook theologians all the time social media pastors it, it's interesting how i read these things and i think and i i sometimes i think my goodness you're not getting taught the word and you're certainly not reading it because what you're writing isn't scriptural at all and yet you're giving this advice and all of that well, you know what? Sometimes people say, just ask and you'll receive. You know, whatever you want, just ask. Well, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, I, I'm so grateful to God, and I won't belabor this. You all agree with this, I know. I am so grateful to God that he didn't answer every one of my prayers in the way I wanted him to. I am thankful that God has said no. That there are, there are prayers that I've prayed where he has simply said no. And you know what? I appreciate that because I, 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 I have learned. I have learned, God, I just want to do things according to your will. I don't want to be anywhere that you're not. I don't want anything you don't want me to have. You know, because he can give, like the psalmist said, he, he answered their prayers. He gave them what they desired but sent leanness to their souls. I don't, I don't want to be asking for something that is going to take me from you. I'm not going to ask you. For that. I had a young lady many years ago, and I'm talking about probably 37 years ago. She's not a young lady anymore. Neither I'm not a young man anymore. But anyway, she, she came into my office, and we were talking, and she, was, she asked me, um, would you please pray f I, I, for me? I said, of course, because she was about to leave and I said and what would I be praying for and she said I I want you to pray um, uh, for me so that this boy she was in high school she said this boy that I like in high school that he'll he'll become my boyfriend you know I don't pray those kinds of prayers I have to be honest with you um, but anyway so I'm I, but that was her heart and I said really and and let me ask you one question and she said what is that I said is he a Christian and she says no no he's not a Christian I said, why would you ask me to pray for something God doesn't want you to have? Because God says, if you ask anything in my name, I will give it to you. And that's where a lot of people's minds are to this day. If you ask anything in, in my name, I will give it to you. I said, no, we need to learn to pray according to the will of the Lord. And sometimes people don't get their prayers answered in the way they want because 
it isn't the will of the Lord. There are times that we simply lack the faith to trust that he's going to answer us. Again, in James chapter 4, verse 2, you don't have because you don't ask. Sometimes we simply don't ask. And so there are times when, when your prayer doesn't seem to be answered or isn't answered quickly or at all. But in this case, we see a reason for the hindrance to the answer of prayer. It's satanic opposition. God had heard his prayer, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood. Now, this gives us insight, insight into Satan's work of opposition. You see, sometimes when prayers aren't answered quickly, opposition is occurring. All during his time of prayer and fasting, there was a battle taking place. Notice verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. The, the prince of the kingdom of Persia is a fallen angel. What you have is you have fallen angels that are given in Satan's hierarchy of authority certain places that they actually exercise certain influences, if you will. This one's referred to as the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And so he's over a certain geographical area. They're called demonic principalities. In Ephesians 6, verse 12, Paul said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So there is an actual organization of evil where Satan is overseeing it, and he has placed demonic influences over certain geographic areas. This one is referred to as the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So it's a demonic stronghold. There are demons overseeing spiritual oppression. Does that exist to this day? Absolutely. There are certain countries that are dominated by demonic spirits. Countries that have, have yielded themselves to false beliefs. So you can look at like different areas with different religions that are the main religion. They have yielded themselves to demonic oppression. They resist you with the gospel. They forbid you from speaking it in that area. It's a stronghold. But not only countries, there are states. Here in the United States, when my mom, when my mom uh, moved to, to New Mexico, I wonder if I have any New Mexicans in here with me. Do I? Raise your hand if you're from New Mexico. I can't see you, so that means you're not here. But there may be some watching right now. You guys know your food isn't any good. But anyway... <laughs> I get in arguments with my New Mexican friends. I have family in New Mexico. My, my mom lived there. And my uh, sisters live there. I have a brother who lives there. And also, I have family in New Mexico, so I tease about it. But, but with that said, when my mom moved there, my mom would, would talk to me on the phone, and she would say, she'd say, son, this is a very demonic place. It's a very demonic place. And I, and I have to agree. I have to agree. Marie and I have gone to New Mexico many times, and you can sense the strongholds. It's true. You can sense it, that there is a sense of, of evil. There is so much, so much in certain regions. And you can actually take that to cities. You can take that to cities. Anywhere there is a university in, in your area here, you're going to have a stronghold. And somebody says, are you kidding me about that? No, you're going to have a stronghold. You're going to have a stronghold. Claremont has several universities there. It's a, it's a stronghold. I ministered in Claremont for a long time. There is, it's a stronghold. It's very difficult to minister there. San Luis Obispo used to have a very conservative feel, but they have Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. And I was just speaking with someone just yesterday who was telling me how the entire city has changed over the years, and it's become a principality. It's become a stronghold. And, it, and, and I'll tell you, especially in ministry, there are times when, when, you know, because God gives you the Holy Spirit, and I as a minister will enter into an area sometimes, and, and, and I'm not trying to tell you silly stories. It's just true, and some will understand. Others will think this is nonsense, but it's true. You can sense. 
you can sense there's something evil here. There is something evil here. You can sense that. And what that's called, it's, 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 it, there are principalities, there are, there are areas that are oversought, uh, oversought by, by demonic entities. In this particular area, you have it here. You have the Prince of Persia. And the Prince of Persia is, is demonic. It's a demonic stronghold. And, and the opposition was so strong that the answer to the prayer that Daniel had been praying was actually, it took three weeks for it to actually be answered. And notice what he says here when he's speaking about that. He says in verse 13, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Michael had to come and help me because it was a stronghold that was so mighty. Michael is an extremely powerful angel. And so the way that the answer is coming is by using one of his mighty, mighty angels here. And this angel needed to call on Michael for help. When we get to chapter 12, verse 1, and I'll read this to you, you're going to see something about Michael that's revealed to us. It speaks of Michael in verse 1 of chapter 12. It says, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. So the way this prince of Persia was in opposition, Michael is the angel that has authority there, the one who keeps watch over the nation of Israel. And so Michael came to help. Now, this is, this is just something I'm going to give to you because, well, because you may need to know this someday. And I'll make it brief. And this is not an aside. This is just an added thing. Um, when you speak to people who represent the Jehovah's Witnesses, how many of you have spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses? Almost, almost all of us. Almost all of us. Jehovah's Witnesses in their theology, there are a lot of people who believe that Jehovah's Witnesses are Christian. They call themselves Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. So there are a lot of people who would say, oh, they're Christians just like we are. No, they're, they're really not. No, they're not. What do you mean? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, will say that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel. Did you know that? Some of you did. Some of you don't. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you Michael the Archangel is Jesus Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses will say to you that the name Michael means who is like God. And so they will say that Jesus Christ is actually Michael the Archangel. And I've had many discussions with Jehovah's Witnesses about this, and that's exactly what they say. Oh, no, no, Jesus is not God in the flesh. There's only one God. Jesus is Michael the Archangel, is what they say, because the name means who is like God. And the response to that is that is not true at all. Uh, when you look in the New Testament book of Jude, verse 9, it says, Even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So Michael did not have the authority in himself to rebuke Satan. He didn't have that. So he had to call on the one greater than himself. And that's why he said, The Lord rebuke you. But in Matthew 4, when the Lord Jesus Christ was being tempted by Satan, it says in verses 8 through 10 that the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Notice that Jesus did not say, the Lord rebuke you. Jesus himself rebuked him. And so that's a great difference. And when I've spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses, I've said, why is it that, that, uh, that Michael had to call on the Lord to rebuke the enemy, but Jesus himself didn't have to do that? It's because Jesus isn't Michael the archangel. It's because Jesus is God in the, fle in the flesh. That's how that works. And so with that said, one commentator pointed out that the prince of Persia is speaking of an angel. And 
But if you look at this, and uh, I don't want to go without touching this, it says in verse 13 again, I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So you have the prince of the kingdom of Persia, but he says, I've been left alone with the kings of Persia. So one com commentator pointed out that the prince of Persia, speaking of an angel, but the kings of Persia were not speaking of an angel. The kings of Persia were referring to the political power and a major victory was won over the demonic forces that were influencing Persia, and the kings became more open to the Spirit of God because of what is taking place here, which is another way of saying that the enemy has a tendency of trying to infiltrate the political systems on the face of the earth to make it impossible or difficult to preach the messages that bring people to salvation. That's part of what we're seeing in the United States right now in the forbidding of proclamation of the gospel. When churches, and I won't go into this a long time, don't worry, but when churches were being shut down by fiat, by governmental orders, that you were seeing was a demonic work to keep the gospel from going forth. But with God, all things are possible and, and the enemy can't shut down the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and we saw that. And so with that said, he says, I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people. I, I've come to reveal to you what is going to happen in the latter days. This we're going to see in chapters 11 and 12. And so moving into verse 15 and moving to conclude, when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. Suddenly, one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me. I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. And then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh, man, greatly beloved, Fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And he said, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. So once again, Daniel is speechless. Daniel is weak. And so one having the likeness of the sons of men touches his lips. And he recovers his speech. And as he recovers his speech, the first thing he begins to do is confess his weakness. His, his weakness that he's experiencing is a physical reaction to his sense of unworthiness. And as this is taking place, verses 18 and 19 tell us that he received a touch and encouragement, and it strengthened him. And notice how it says here, you are greatly loved, fear not, receive peace, and be courageous. Because God loves you, you can be courageous, and you can have peace. When I was a young believer... And I was in college, and, and this has happened in other places, but it always comes to mind, is a new believer and knew very little scripture. I'm still a new believer. I was, you know, I was learning, I was studying, going to school, but I was going to secular college and all. And I can still remember when I went to school that uh, the, the Lord began to minister to me something that I want to encourage all you to. And that is, he said, open your mouth and I will fill it. He said, it's the spirit of my father who speaks in you. You need to take into yourself the word of God so that you have, you're filling yourself with God's word. And then you need to be ready to speak when given opportunity. In our day, it seems to me that people are afraid to speak out openly. And, 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 and if, if there's ever been a time when believers need to, with love, grace, and, and all of that, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to be willing to speak, but we need to do so with love and grace. I, I believe that a lot of, of Christians right now are actually have lost their courage, have lost their ability to speak. 
And, and recently I was sharing with somebody about the Jesus movement and all, and I realized that that's ancient history, but it's still, it's still a benchmark in my life that helps me to understand what I'm to be doing now 50 years later. And the bottom line is, is during that day, one of the reasons you saw the movement of the Spirit of God in the way that you did in that day is because young people like myself didn't wait until we had seven years of college experience in theology to begin to present. What we did is we simply gave what we knew of the Word of God, and we mixed that with the experience of our testimony. That's how it worked. And so I, I, I was one. I can still remember saying this. Listen, I can't answer questions like that. I don't know, but I do know this. I do know that I was raised in a religion. I do know that that religion didn't set me free. I do know that there were traditions and things I was told to do that was supposed to make me a believer and, and bless my life. And those things did not work. And let me tell you why they didn't. And I, I would say this. It's because Jesus wasn't in the center of it. Jesus wasn't there. It was religious tradition without spirit. And so when I came to faith in Christ, I didn't know much, but I knew this. I was once lost, and now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once without the ability to hear, but now I can hear the Spirit. And I may not be able to answer your question, but you cannot argue me out of my salvation because Jesus Christ sets the captives free. And, that, and that's all I knew. I didn't know anything more than that, but it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. We got to come back to that. We got to come back to that. Isaiah sees the Lord. In the year the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and he was lifted up. His train filled the, the temple. There was smoke throughout the temple. I, I saw the winged angels as they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy. And I said to myself, I said out loud, I said, Oh, I'm an evil man, a wicked man. A man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. For the Lord said, who will go for us? And God took a coal from that, from that and a coal was placed on his lips from that, that altar, purifying him. And he said, go. And that's how it works. I, I, I made a statement to the Lord a long time ago as a young man, I said, Lord, if nobody else will speak for you, please give me the courage to do it. Somebody has to. Somebody has to speak in your name to a world that is lost. Today, to a generation that is hopeless. I came from a similar generation, a hopeless generation. And then we found out there is hope. And it's in Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness of sins. It comes through Jesus Christ. There is such a thing as love, and it can be pure, and it comes through Jesus Christ. I don't need the drugs. I don't need the alcohol. I don't need those sexual relationships. What I need is him. And when that comes through, your life is transformed. And, and he was strengthened. It, it says in verse 19, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be to you. Be strong, be strong, yes, be strong. And when he spoke to me, I was strengthened. The Lord will strengthen you from within. And so he closes by saying in verse 20 and 21, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. When I've gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece, these are two um, demonic um, oppressors like the prince of Persia, prince of Greece, same thing. I will tell you what is noted in scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. And so this is actually an introduction that, to what is going to take place as we get back together and look at chapter 11. And he's simply saying there's going to be a continuing spiritual war, but I'm going to give you insight into what is about to take place and what will take place. And we'll stop here. And we'll pick up next time at chapter 11. Our Father, we ask that there's so many things that we could be asking you to help us with. But we would ask that our, our, our ears would be open to what the Spirit says and our eyes would see that 
there is demonic stronghold. There are demonic strongholds, Lord, even in our area. And Lord, it can appear sometimes that there's nothing we can do. But as we see that Daniel was without strength because he saw of how great you were, and that was a good starting point for him, I, I pray that we would realize that we too are in, in a different way, but we are without strength, and without you we can do nothing. So I pray for the church. I pray for all of us. I pray that you would work within us and that, Lord, you would have your way and that we would follow you with all of our heart and that your word would actually be our guide and that your word will be the joy and the strength of our lives. And so, Lord, I ask that you would strengthen each person in this room right now and that we would be used as a mighty army to reach people, to be willing to speak. We ask that we would just open our mouth. And, and Lord, just allow your spirit to give us the words to speak. And even as our eyes are closed before we conclude, if there's anybody right now who needs prayer, need, you need to get right with the Lord. I, I want to pray for you before we close. And if you do need prayer to get right with him would you raise your hand let me pray for you right now right where you're at father you see these hands you know the reason why they're being raised to you and i ask in jesus name that you would reach down and touch each one whose hand is raised to you you know exactly what is needed and lord we would yield to you right now we would yield to you we thank you for your washing and your cleansing we thank you for the newness of life we have in you and we receive by faith lord and we will walk with you now so we bless you and thank you. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And again, if there be anybody in, in this room right now that has a need for a physical touch, a healing of the Lord, I, I want to pray for you for that too before we close. If your body is breaking down, you need prayer, I, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand before we close? Lord, you see these whose, whose bodies are, are rebelling against them right now. I ask in Jesus' name that you would by your power, that you would touch them, Lord, as they open their heart and they say, God, we, we need your touch. We, we need to be healed, Lord. Our bodies are in need of you. Would you please, Lord, because you are the, the Lord, our healer, I, I pray that you would touch these lives and that you would bring healing. And, Father, that all the glory, all the glory will go to you. By faith we say, God, please, and we ask that you will. And we would, by faith, receive and thank you for it. And we bless you. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I ask that as we're about to leave, as we worship in one last song, I, I pray that you would go with us. And we give you praise in Jesus' name.